So next we're going to look at hair and nails. First, it's important to recognize that the accessory organs of the integumentary system include the hair, nails, and cutaneous glands. And the stratum corneum is made of the pliable soft keratin, but hair and nails are composed of a hard keratin. So there's some differences in the type of keratin. So that kind of makes sense why our fingernails and hair feel differently. Um, and so what that just means is that the hard keratin is more compact by more cross linkages than the softer um, keratin. So here is a, an image of the hair. So the part of the hair that's out of the skin we call the shaft. The part that's below the skin surface is called the bulb. And here we have the same diagram. This is an electronic, or I'm sorry, a microscope view of it. And so the hair is technically called a pilus, and plural would be pili or pili. And so that kind of the old name for the muscle here is called the erector muscle. It used to be called the erector pili or pilus muscle. So it was the hair erector muscle. And um, the hair is described as a slender filament of keratinized cells that grows from an oblique tube in the skin called a hair follicle. So the hair follicle is the opening. This is called a pili or pilus. All right, so we have lots of hair. Um, we'll come back to the composition. We're going to talk about the structure here a little bit more. So um, depending on where we look, we know that um, hair doesn't occur on the lips, nipples, parts of the genitals, palm soles, and parts of the fingers and toes. Now, some say, well, I do have some hair on the nipples. Well, some people will have hair in the areola, but not directly from the nipple. And yes, parts of the genitals can, but parts don't. Um, pretty rare for the palms of your hands. Um, but again, we know variability is one of those things, so some people might. Uh, we see different distribution patterns, right? The trunk and limbs have about 55 to 70 hairs per square centimeter. The face has about 10 times as many. There's about 30,000 hairs in a man's beard and about 100,000 on the average scalp. And the density doesn't really differ much. Um, but we do have different types of hair. So we have, um, on an unborn baby, we have what they call downy hair. Um, newborn hair is still very small. It's called vellus hair. And also, vellus hair is on the majority of a woman's hair, two-thirds of it, and about one-tenth of the men of the hair of, of a man. And kids, um, until they hit puberty, um, except for their eyebrows, eyelashes, and on the scalp of their hair. And terminal hair is the longer, coarser kind of hair um, that we see on eyebrows and eyelashes and the scalp. And that we get later on in puberty um, for axillary pubic male facial hair and some of the hair on the trunk and limbs. So what does hair do? What is its function? Well, here we have the same table. And so the hair of the torso and limbs, really it just lets us feel if something is crawling on us. The hair on our head helps for protection. The coarser hair of the beard, pubic, and axillary hair, um, well, one, it, it demonstrates that you're becoming a mature individual. Um, also, the um, apocrine glands, they secrete pheromones um, in the um, fatty substances that is in that sweat. And so that is um, a desirous smell. And um, you see this in some cases where 
um, a group of females together and they will get on the same menstrual cycle. And that is from the pheromones that their nose is picking up. They don't even realize it. And it helps set all of them on the same monthly cycle. Um, eyebrows um, we use for expression. Of course, in some cases, it may help reduce the sun. And then guard hairs, primarily eyelashes, nose, and in the ear help protect. Okay, so when we look at the components of a hair, we mentioned the shaft is the part that's out of the skin. The bulb is the part that's in the skin. And um, I'm sorry, not bulb, the root. This is the hair root. The bulb is this lower portion. And um, the only living part of the cell, uh, I'm sorry, of the hair, is the bulb. Okay. And um, the bulb grows around this little collection of blood capillaries in the dermal papilla. And it kind of follows um, the, the dermal papilla kind of moves up and down as the hair follicle grows. We have this little um, hair matrix. The hair matrix is the um, um, growth center of the bulb. And so this is the region where um, the hair's um, cells are actively dividing. And so what actually happens is the follicle which is made up of two layers. Part of it is from the epithelial layer and part of it is a connective tissue layer. Um, part of the follicle cells actually become cells that become keratinized cells. And we'll look at that more here as we, we look at the growth of a hair. But the hair um, uh, root is made up of a couple of different layers. And if we go back up here, you can see the medulla is the middle. Then we have the cortex, which is the majority of um, the, the layers. And so, see here, medulla is the core. The cortex is the bulk of the hair. And it consists of several layers of elongated keratinized cells that appear cuboidal to flatten. And the cuticle... Um, you actually have to look at the beginning of this chapter. So these are the cuticle cells. They're kind of flat cells that overlap, kind of like roof tiles, but the opening points upwards. So you can see how they progressively move forward. So this is the outer cuticle layer of the hair. And let's see, so we talked about all of those structures. So this is where I was talking about the follicle. The follicle is this diagonal tube. It has two layers, the epithelial root sheath and the connective tissue root sheath. And they move towards deep into the follicle and it forms this bulge. And so here you can see the bulge is this layer right here. And this bulge is also where the nerve ending and the muscle and all of those things attach to. And so the bulge is the source of stem cells for follicle growth. Okay. And so that's important for the follicle because the follicle um, we see changes as well. And um, so what happens is we have these other tissues that are around it. We have a hair receptor that are entwined with the follicle. We have the muscle. It's a bundle of smooth muscle that extends towards the connective tissue root sheath and it is in response to cold fear touch or other stimuli and um, it doesn't really have much other purpose other than for us is um, gives hair uh, goosebumps so as we can continue to look at hair here's the different layers medulla is loosely arranged cells it's the center the cortex is the bulk of the hair. It's kind of cuboidal shaped cells, several layers of long fibers. It has the pigment in it. Okay. And lastly is the cuticle. We mentioned the overlapping. So what happens is in um, 
dark hair, it has more of the dark type of melanin, the eumelanin. Red hair has less of the eumelanin, but more of the pheomelanin. And blonde hair has an intermediate amount of pheomelanin, but very little eumelanin. And gray or white hair has none. The shape of your hair, meaning if you have straight hair, you have a very round hair shape. If you have wavy hair, it's more oval. And if your hair is um, curly, it's flat. All right. So, oh, here's another one. Here's a good view of the hair matrix, the hair bulb, and the dermal papilla. Okay, so the hair growth and loss cycle. So it's important to know that the hair goes through cycles. And we have what's known as the antigen phase, and that is the growth phase. And so a hair follicle will produce a hair for years, potentially, particularly on the scalp. And this is uh, a mature antigen phase. You can see the um, dermal papillae is, and follicle are deep into the dermis. Um, we've got a nice long hair. Well, what happens is after the antigen cycle completes, and it's different for everyone, the hair follicle will go through a catagen phase. And what happens is the hair bulb actually um, closes off and it turns into a club. So it keratinizes and it stops producing um, new keratinized cells. It doesn't continue to grow. And so it comes um, basically a club hair. And during this phase, um, the hair might stay in or it would potentially come out very easily. And when this happens, the um, lower follicle degenerates, okay? And it kind of goes into this next phase where it's the telogen phase. And this is a resting phase where nothing really happens. And during this phase, the derma papilla will actually move upwards towards the follicle, what's left of it, because see, it's, it's kind of followed the, the hair as it was exiting. Um, and it will move back up to the bulge, which is that area of tissues that has stem cells. And when, a, um, when the blood flow begins to start again, um, the next antigen phase starts. So if we go back up here to the antigen phase, okay, stem cells from the bulge, um, they um, start to multiply and they travel downward. So see what happens is the follicle is way up here and it's going to work its way back down. And it will push the dermal papilla deeper into the layer that forms a new epithelial root sheath. And the root sheath cells directly above the papilla form the hair matrix. So here, the sheath cells transform into hair cells, which synthesize keratin, and then they die and are pushed upward away from the papilla. So you have this kind of transition from um, sheath cells to hair cells to making a new hair. And so in this diagram, what this is showing is that the old hair never left. It stayed in place, but a new hair is starting to grow. And so sometimes people notice that they'll have two hairs growing out of the same follicle. And so you have an old hair and a new hair growing in. So those are the different phases of hair growth. And we lose about 50 to 100 scalp hairs daily. If you're having thin hair, we call that alopecia. And a variety of things can cause that. Being unhealthy is usually one of the main ones. Um, pattern baldness, that's usually a male thing. And that's just a specific area that is losing its um, hair. Now we want to talk about uh, fingernails real quick. And when we look at fingernails, the toughness of the what we call nail body is a derivative from the stratum corneum. 
which is the tougher outer layer, right? It's dead. Um, the tip of it is called the free edge. We have the groove. So these are the two areas that when you're washing your hands, you have to make it get clean. We have the skin that folds in along the edge. The little white region that's at the proximal end of your fingernail is called the uh, lunu and lunial, sorry. And um, it's white because the matrix where the nail is growing from obs obscures uh, or covers over the um, capillary bed. So it looks a little whiter in comparison. The cuticle. Uh, of course, has a fancy name, and the cuticle is called the eponychium. And the layer directly underneath the nail bed has a big fancy name, and it's called the hyponychium. And that's this layer right down here under the nail bed. So we have the free edge, nail body, cuticle, eponychium. Um, underneath the nail bed, we have the hyponychium. And down here, where we have the uh, root, the nail root, this portion right here, also under part of the skin that folds over, um, is the nail matrix. And this nail matrix obscures the blood flow being seen, and that's what causes the uh, lineal. And so those are the major structures there. The nail itself is actually a layer, uh, or it's derived from the um, uh, basali layer. And that's where the matrix grows from. The matrix um, kind of is the growth source. And so when it grows, it grows about a millimeter per week. And so the uh, nail bed is a component of the, um, the thick, tough layer of the uh, stratium corneum, but the matrix is from the stratum basale. Okay, let's see here. Uh, next we have glands. And we've talked about glands before. Uh, we have sweat glands. We have two types. We have apocrine glands that have a thicker, milkier secretion because it has more fatty acids in it. Um, that can also be what leads to BO. Um, and we know now that as this diagram here shows, um, you can see the lumen in an apocrine gland is just very large, and so it allows those... Um, fatty acids to be um, released, but an eccrine gland here, you can see the lumen is very small. So the eccrine gland tends to be the waterier of the kind of sweat. It has very similar composition to um, urine, actually. Um, it has um, some salt in it. It's got some uric acid. Um, it's got other substances that um, ammonia that we find in urine, but because there's three to four million sweat glands, it's about the same total mass as one kidney. Um, we find um, sweat glands, we have a lot of them in our palms, in our soles, forehead, uh, all over the body. They are a simple tubular gland that's twisted. The um, apocrine glands um, also secrete sex hormones into them. And then we have sebaceous glands, which are um, oily secretions, so called sebum. We have a lot of these on the face and scalp. And this is actually just broken down cells, right? We call that holocrine. Then we have the apocrine glands that are in the external ear canal, and they secrete a yellow waxy substance. And we have mammary glands, and mammary glands, um, we have um, um, eccrine and we have apocrine. And this is 
because part of it is for the fatty substances and part of it is for the um, proteins and sugars. And so we have two different types. Um, and we'll talk about them more in um, actually chapter 26. And that brings us to the end of what we wanted to get talked about here today. Um, we looked at this previously. Um, there's our different types. We have the merocrine or eccrine glands, apocrine and holocrine. And here we have, see how an, uh, the type of sweat gland uh, here, the apocrine, that leads into the um, hair follicle. The last thing we want to talk about is we want to look at skin disorders. So we have acne, dermatitis, eczema, psoriasis, ringworm, rosacea, and warts. And but we want to talk about cancers. And so basal cell carcinoma, we have a couple of different pictures. Most common, least dangerous, basal. So it's from the basal or basali layer, usually on the face. And these are pretty easy to move surgically. Then we have squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma is from the stratum spinosum. The problem with this one is it can go to the lymph nodes. It can be on the scalp, ears, lower lip, and the back of the hand and you get these scaly plaques, but again, it can be moved surgically. And then we have melanoma. Melanoma is from melanocytes. So now you kind of understand the names of these. Um, it's usually in an existing mole. It's the most deadly, but it's only 5%. Surgery, chemo, and radiation. And here's the A, B, C, D, E rule for looking at a mole. You want to look for asymmetry, you want to look at the border, you want to look at the color, the diameter, and how it's evolving. And um, so you look and see if it's changed in its appearance, the color changes, it's getting bigger, it's changing, you know, how it might be changing, um, and you report those things right away. Burns. We we'll want to look at burns. Burns is another one that you'll see um, pretty common. Sunburn is a first degree burn. It's only the epidermis and you're going to have some redness and some minor pain. Really no treatment. Second degree burns is going to be partial thickness into the dermis. You're going to see potentially some um, scalding and sunburns. This is blistered and painful. Okay. Um, damage to the nerves, and so that's why it's so painful. Third degree, you hear in movies all the time how third degree burns are so painful. Unfortunately, third degree burns are full thickness and it kills the nerves, so they're actually pain free. But they're the most deadly because of fluid loss and infection, and other problems is um, these are very disfiguring. Um, the scar tissue that heals back in its place is very, very difficult to work with. Um, they have to have skin grafts, and there's usually quite a bit of disfigurement. And so when they measure burns, um, they look at what they call the rules of nine. And so there's 11 areas, and each area gets 9%, but the genital area only gets one. So you've got 1%. Uh, I'm sorry, 9% for the front of the leg, 9% for the back of the leg. So you get 18% there, 45 for the front of the arm, 45 for the back of the arm, 18% for the back and buttocks, 18% for the um, trunk, and then 45 for the front and back of the head. For babies they and little kids, they do it a little more. Specific, we're just going to look at, I just want you to know the adults. Aging, um, these are just some common conditions that occur with 
um, aging and we talked about these uh, diagnostic skin, skin terms already. So we'll talk more about some of these unique skin issues um, in lab as there's some interesting things that we can talk about there.